Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Episode 14, Decoding and Notational Audiation. So we're going to be talking about uh, yeah. decoding music notation and um, and specifically, you know, how this relates to playing an instrument like the piano. Um, but other instruments would, yeah, would count as um, well for sure. And I got a lot to say about decoding in the guitar because I think there are some extra issues involved with decoding and string instruments that you can't just kind of toss aside. So we had, a, yeah, we had a listener uh, that said that there's lots of uh, questions that pop up for her. And um, she had a question, is it possible to be a good sight reader with high rhythm aptitude at the piano, but not necessarily a high tonal aptitude. And then would it be best for types of students that are like that to drop the notation? And can reading notation at the piano stifle tonal audiation? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot in and then there. The, the, to... <laughs> then there's, so we... uh, what about you know, <laughs> yeah, for other ahead. instruments, you think they'd be more tonal audiation necessary because you know you can press the piano key but when you're playing a horn or especially string instrument you need to be able to audiate pretty well to play it better in tune where piano is already tuned well yeah i mean there's no doubt intonation is dependent on audiation but if you if you hear a lot of violinists talk that don't seem to know what audiation is their intonation strategies seem uh very odd and peculiar you know um, some of them seem to know about learning how to sing everything you play or singing the resting tone you'll hear violin and viola pedagogues say that like they'll just randomly sing the resting tone um while they're trying to play their part but i mean let's maybe we should start with the mlt um definition of sight reading is generally different than the 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 overarching music population's definition of sight reading. And I think this is where a lot of the confusion begins. And so um, with sight reading, you know, the general music community, especially the instrumental community, I don't feel this is as much as a problem with the singing community, but it's definitely an issue with this. The instrumental community, we think someone is sight reading when we put music in front of them they've never seen and they can play it on their instrument. That's generally how most of the world thinks of sight reading. but the issue with that is that is really at the heart of what this question is getting at is that even if you're rhythmically playing the right things, so you could be audiating, notationally audiating the rhythms, um, you could totally not be tonally audiating what you're playing on an instrument, especially an instrument like the piano or the guitar or the saxophone or whatever, because they're generally, you know, get your finger in the right place and make the right sound with the right rhythm. And a lot of the tonal audiation stuff can go out the window. There, There is a point where that breaks down because phrasing stops working if you're not audiating the harmony properly because you lose out on the the proper ebb and flow of the tension and the release of the phrases and all that. But generally, you could yep. get away yep. with this, right? And so that, that's kind of what's at the heart of the question. But when Gordon's talking about sight reading, he's he's literally talking about, when he's talking about notational audiation, whether or not you have an instrument with you, when you see the notation, you're audiating the rhythm and the harmony. And But there's a lot of layers to notational audiation, right? It's not just tonal, because uh, um, there's different layers to tonal audiation. There's different layers to rhythmic audiation. But, you know, you could be doing one of them or many of them and, and not the other one, right? I mean, you could be audiating the tonality notationally, but missing out on some of the functions. That's yeah, totally for, possible. for sure. Um, um, if you're notationally audiating, it doesn't matter, <clears throat> you know, what's in front of you, what's in your mouth or what, what instrument you've got. Um, you're, you're really making up. It's a cre here's the thing about, about that is that sight reading is a creative act. You're, you're going mm -hmm. beyond, um, you know the notes on the page to make music and, and there's there's so oh, sure. 
little yeah. on the page when you really consider it. Um, and if you're not audiating <laughs> notationally, there's only a limited amount of information that you're going to be able to uh, bring bring to your play. Totally agree. And there, I mean, the one kind of denotational audiation I don't hear spoken about a lot is being able to audiate. Uh, I guess it's a type of rhythmic audiation, but um, it, it's, it has nothing to do with audiating the meter or audiating the rhythm patterns or the microbeats or macrobeats or whatever. But uh, it's more about audiating the phrases. So you can see the phrases unfolding on the page, whether by eight bars or 16 bars. And you can actually learn to like, I was sight reading this piece the other day, and um, I could see quite early on that there was an extra bar, right? So it was supposed to be a 16 bar phrase, but there was an extra bar before the transition. And you learn to audiate those like chunks before they come at you. And then obviously this gets more complicated with music that doesn't follow these like classic structures that you've learned to audiate like these eight bar structures and these 16 bar structures they are things that you learn to audiate and when there are things that are outside of that it can kind of throw you off like a lot of you know contemporary music is just all over the place like it's hard to it's hard to notationally audiate that if you've never heard anything like that because you can't generalize and you haven't you haven't gone through the sequence necessarily but i think that's an interesting you know part of sight reading is being able to absorb these like larger uh, chunks in the music. I mean, um, or often with classical music, you'll see the theme repeated in the dominant key, and you and you learn to see those things and audiate them before they yeah, before they come at you. Isn't there like we can't be audiating tonally and rhythmically at the same time? It's like you look at the rhythm pattern that you're about to play, and then you're audiating tonally over that rhythm pattern, and and you've got you've chunked one or one or the other, right? So that you could then. Or, or I mean, or essentially, you're just you. You know, I think that's that's the mystery of melody, right? Is that, uh, and you've even talked about this on the podcast, where until kids get to a certain age, it's actually not that useful to split the tonal patterns and the rhythm patterns up because they just they audiate it as this like total just all. It's it's it, it's hard to get them to diffuse the two. Um, they, yeah, well, you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> With yeah. melody, right? I mean, you can do chants and you can do tonal patterns, but there's there's something about the the fusion of the two is greater than the sum of it is greater than the, the yeah. Parts. With the early music aptitude measures, I mean, early like you know, mine starting at two and a half or three years old, and then Dr. Gordon's the three and a half <clears throat> is is earlier four, where children need to uh, respond to melody, they don't respond to a tonal or a rhythm by itself well and then and then when you can mm -hmm. measure children older you know kindergarten on up to third fourth grade they again um it, it, it the reverse is true that it's better for them not to have to um, process both at the same time so that's why you have a tonal by itself aptitude measure and a rhythm mm -hmm. by itself aptitude measure for those age children and then at fourth grade when you go to mm. music aptitude profile if and and above now you've got to uh, respond to the gestalt again where you're listening to melodies um and that that's the the better mm -hmm. way you know to measure audiation so when you say you know children respond to the gestalt it's like it's on either side of those and that's an interesting thing to think about while we're sure. answering this question um just how that overlaps with uh how how you use your brain at different age groups uh to respond to notation which is just you know it's just another it's an achievement level of mm -hmm. you know measure measurement of their audiation i think anytime Anytime you're, mm -hmm. you know, say cheating and playing the notes on the page and getting that right without tonal audiation or without high tonal aptitude, you can get away uh, with sounding pretty good at the piano. Well, and this is where I think there's there's variations of this, right? Because like, uh, like so, for example, when I first started playing, I had a huge listening vocabulary and I was singing and chanting and all that. So and I started with notation right away. But, uh, you know, I've said before on this podcast, I noticed a lot of the people 
in my music class, they didn't seem to be audiating like the melodies they were playing. Like I was kind of, I was just playing everything by memory, but I could kind of decode the page at the same time. It wasn't really an issue. But one thing I've noticed in the past uh, five or six years, especially, but it's been growing over the last 10 years is um, there's like, I'm audiating the functions while I read the page at the same time. And so like before I would audiate, you know, some tonal patterns and, and I could audiate the, I was audiating the, 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 the resting tone and the, the keyality and all that and the tonality, but I wasn't necessarily like consciously aware of the functions in the way that I am now. Like now, you know, if we're in a certain key and I sort of see certain tones on certain macro beats, certain functions are coming to my mind. Like my, my mind is um, like, here's another way to say it. If I'm reading like a single line melody, even on the guitar. So there's only, mm-hmm. you know, there's no harmony necessarily. There's no, uh, harmony explicitly provided by the notes like if i'm playing a bach piece my mind's still thinking of tonal patterns and harmonic progressions even though it's just you know a single line melody and it, it, a lot of the time uh, I, i'm curious if the composer is thinking of the same things that i am because some of the you know my 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 ideas might be different than theirs but that's one thing i've i've noticed that's been a big change in the past 10 years um, but 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 what I meant, to, what I wanted to bring that up for is because in the beginning, I definitely was audiating the the tonality and the keyality. I could sing the resting tone and a lot of the to- a lot of the patterns on the page, whether they were scales or tonal patterns, I could I could predict how they were going to sound before they were happening. Like, I you know, I had some idea of it, but the the tonal, the the tonal audiation and the notational side of that has gotten much deeper. Oh, oh yeah, um, and I'm sure it has for you as well. Oh yeah, no. So it's it's cool that no, there's like levels to this, right? Just teaching, and you know, just teaching kids, you know, total pads, rhythm patterns, harmonic patterns, and you know, functions and all that over the years. I, without even practicing sight reading uh, at all, I don't know when the last time I I sight read something really. Um, like that, that yeah. would be, you know, my level of of some kind of you know, put, you know, put, push, push me a little bit. Um, you know, I, I see the, the patterns, um, you know, and then there's like, you know, scale passages, like how, how do your fingers know the scale passage, you know, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you just look at, uh, and, and chunk it and then bring expression to what's not, uh, written down in the in the notation, uh, making music out of what you're seeing. Uh, how much of that could be? Am I cheating by you know having had? Is it cheating by just having the muscle memory of these things you know in, in your in your fingers or in your breath or what have you? Uh, you know I yeah yeah. I mean, you bring up a good point about about the phrasing, because like a, a lot of the times I don't think people can notationally audiate things like dynamics or like, you know, I play guitar. There's a lot of different tonal qualities that the composers will write in. They might want something played uh, with like a very thin, tinny sound or like a very uh, tasteful sound. And there's directions for this in the music. But I wonder how often when people are just kind of sitting with their score, you know, they're able to bring that all online uh, and because basically, I mean, this is. This is one of the reasons I love how Galper, we just had that, it, we just posted that interview with him, but you're, you know, the instrument is somewhat of an illusion. You know, the instrument's a tool that you're using to bring through what you're audiating. And if the brain signal, this is the way he describes it, and I really agree with this. If the brain signal for the melody is strong enough, like, like you can just scream the melody or whatever you're audiating in your head, your fingers will react to it. And I think, you know, language is such a great analogy for all of this MLT stuff, but it's just like talking, like, even if I've pre-rehearsed what I want to say, like reading a, a like a script in like a movie or a play, that the whole message of what I'm saying, not just the words, but the intent and the emotion behind it, you know, it's, it's in my mind before I say it. And I'm not really paying attention to the technique of my lips. And I think this is one thing that we get, we get drawn into as instrumentalists is this, you know, some instruments like the piano, guitar, violin these instruments they require so much technique to play well and not like not like wind instruments don't but like there clearly is some kind of technical um 
issue with these instruments where you can get sidetracked into doing a lot of technique work that has to be done, but you can't lose sight of, you know, what you're really training. The, you know, the, the, the Pareto uh, rule for the musician is to train your audiation because that's what being a musician is, is training how you actually perceive and, and audiate music. And the, the technique is there as like a servant to it. And you can, you can hear this in musicians who have this priority uh, in the wrong order where their technique is amazing, but you don't want to listen to them for more than two seconds because it's not actually expressing something. And uh, I mean, it's just something, you know, funny. There's some kind of analogy to like a method actor where they're not even thinking they're just, they're being that character. <laughs> they they stop being themselves <laughs> and they're just so that character. In fact, you know, when they're on break, they maintain that character throughout break. Uh, you know, when I come back and shoot another scene, you know, sure. is that like you're what you're really there as a conduit between the composer and the listener some, somewhere uh, that goes beyond, you know, something that you're going to be able to accomplish by uh, pressing, pressing the right buttons. Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, it's really more than hitting the right notes. I mean, uh, I, I have some students who are doing like the Royal Conservatory exams right now, and I've done them myself in the past. But what I really actually like about how the grading works, um, they don't dock you a lot of marks if you drop notes, right? So if you're playing a piece and it's being expressed well, and you drop a couple notes here and there, but the overall phrasing and the intent of the piece isn't kind of destroyed by dropping a few notes, um, they don't really dock you many notes. And I think that's a correct decision to make because it, it's, Students, I feel like, often have this idea, like, you know, playing a piece means playing each note in the, you know, at the right time in the right order. But, I mean, it's not really a big deal. If you're trying to express, like, a, a, a serious sentence to somebody in, in English, and you make a mistake on one of the words, but the intent of the sentence was pushed through, um, we obviously don't want to speak with more mistakes than is necessary, but there's different kind of kinds of mistakes, right? There's different and making a mistake in the delivery of the sentence um, at large is a bigger mistake than just missing like the pronunciation of one of the syllables. And I almost think about that with uh, with sight reading too. I mean, I think a lot of people have a tendency to, when they're sight reading a piece or a good accompanists are like this too, they, the rhythm trumps yeah. everything else, right? The flow and the yeah. meter. For me, that's a bigger mistake to disrupt the meter than to make a mistake on one of the notes. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's a that's an interesting part about sight reading, so for sure. This other part of her question is, uh, you know, should students drop the notation? Uh, and it's like, it, it, it goes <laughs> well, back to, you know, Hal Galper's episode again, where what what we're really doing is, um, you know, if you, if you want to consider that it's part of the, you know, the oral tradition that you're bringing something to life that you don't understand orally yet. Um, what, what, you know, how are you going to, how, how are you going to bring that to, to bear, bring, well, bring that to life? I mean, so this question, should we get rid of the notation is linked to the other part of uh, what the question I was asking is, is using decoding. Um, going to hinder tonal audiation. And I think there's there's a lot in there. I think the easy answer is to say yes, and that decoding is bad for people and all that. But I mean, the, the bigger question is like, if you're a teacher and you're seeing someone, uh, you know, instrumentals teachers see people once a week for half an hour, an hour, typically, maybe twice a week, if you're lucky, uh, school teachers might see their kids more. But if you only have a certain amount of time, you know, what are your goals, right? And so I, I think even in the case where you're trying to be a classical musician and there's going to be like an obvious need for knowing how to decode and, it, and we'll get into the guitar in a little bit because I have <laughs> some fun points to bring up about decoding in the guitar. But I mean, take take programs like uh, the Suzuki program. I really do think the reason that kids excel with it, even though they're you're not getting the exact same stuff that the, the MLT community is giving younger students is things are learned by rote and you listen to a ton of music. You listen to the songs you're playing, uh, you know, throughout the day. And even myself, uh, I'm learning a whole bunch of classical pieces right now on the guitar. That's what I do. 
I just I just learn the songs. I use the notation because it's not it's not an issue for me right now. But I'm listening to the songs all the time. If there's a really weird tonal pattern in one of the songs I'm learning, I mean, Eric, I've sung some of these tonal patterns I was working on in the past, like you know, more for the 21st century stuff. It's kind of fun. But uh, yeah, I might sing some of those in isolation or improvise with them a little bit. But, you know, essentially, even even if I'm trying to learn classical pieces, I'm listening to the pieces a lot. And there's a big divide in the classical community about doing that. Um, a lot of classical teachers say, you know, you need to develop your own relationship to the score and all that. But I think it's total baloney. I think if you're learning a piece, you should seek out the best musicians you can find that have recorded that piece, and if not, videotape themselves playing it, and watch them and compare them. I mean, it's unfortunate if you can only find one recording because you don't you don't get to see the different ways the the piece can be phrased. But I think you know it's indispensable to if you know if you're learning a classical piano piece, why not listen to the best piano players that have ever lived play the piece? It's it's almost idiotic to not to do that. I think to to think that you should only decode and build your own interpretation because it's going to disrupt some kind of artistic expression. I think it's nonsense. If you can find recordings of the piece, it should be part of your practicing and part of your study of the piece. I mean, why have a teacher if they're not going to play for you once in a while? You know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah, seem no. to cash out for me. Um, even if we're talking about classical music, and I bring the point up with classical music because a lot of people will say like, oh, these these... These MLT methods are great for learning pop or jazz or rock or bluegrass. But, you know, if you're a air quote, serious classical musician, you know, it's not going to cut it. we got to learn how to decode. But I would push back on that because um, some of the best guitarists I've ever met, classical guitarists, um, Douglas Neat, for example, amazing classical guitarist and recording artist performer. He just says, like, before you even start learning the piece, like you should be listening to tons of recordings of it. like, how are you going to know? what's going on when you when you grab the notation if you if you don't have a sense of the piece inside of you and some of these 21st century pieces like they're gonna have tonal patterns and rhythm patterns and odd meter things going on that if you don't have some idea of the piece um it's not like you can't develop it yourself with the score but it just seems uh really musically advantageous to, so to is, listen to is the recording good sight reading uh <laughs> Is good sight reading uh, worthy of the attention we give it? Sight reading is interesting depending on the instrument that you play. For example, like if you're a classical guitarist, we more we normally perform solo repertoire, and I I do think classical guitarists need to be better like sight readers, both in the Gordwinian sense and the decoding sense, um, because it it can hinder your ability to play in a group for sure, but most of the classical guitar game is solo playing. So like, who cares if you can sight read well? Because you're going to be memorizing all the pieces anyway, right? And a lot of classical pianists are like the same thing. I mean, some people have memory issues with these like 21st century pieces. But like, I, I think it does, I think your goals with sight reading do change whether you're going to be playing in groups, both in the Gordwinian sense and the and the decoding sense. I mean, if you're if you're a violinist or a woodwind player, I mean, there's no doubt woodwind players are, are better and brass players are better sight readers in both sense of the words than most guitarists, violinists, and pianists are. I mean, sometimes pianists are, are amazing, but in general, I think it is easier to sight read on a wood wood instrument or a brass instrument. But, I mean, I guess it depends if it's part Do of your we goals. sight read just tonal patterns and sight read rhythm patterns separately? Is that it? I think there's an issue that comes with tonal patterns and this is this is connected to the I guess the Pandora's box that we've opened with the with the tonal learning sequence is that I feel like our methods for teaching the tonal learning sequence over a period of 10 years say you get a kid from 5 to 15 or 2 to 12 you know whatever the age range is or 10 to 20 I don't think our tonal learning sequence uh teaching skills are good enough for what we need them to do yet. I mean, I think we're getting closer with the harmonic learning sequence and and in general, I think it's the Gordon route is more powerful, but you know, like we've said, it's just not fast enough. I mean, it, it's really not it, it, the idea of somebody doing Gordon stuff and then knowing how to tonally audiate 
like a Schoenberg <laughs> piano concerto. <laughs> it's not it's not happening. It's not well, we don't know enough about well, how this is taught yet. At some level cheat unless you're a monster. You know, who's this guy? Uh Lucas sure. Foss. Right? He opens up opens up okay. a score and he reads through it. He's never seen the piece before. And he, when he's done, he puts it down and he plays the dang thing. <laughs> Oh, that's what Glenn Gould would do. Glenn, there's a quote of Glenn Gould saying, like, I don't know why other pianists are um, having to practice so much. I just, like, read the score and I understand the piece <laughs> and then I play it. <laughs> and I can do that with, like, you know, I wonder, I don't know what grade level of piece I could do, like, in the Royal Conservatory's guitar grade. I think if you gave me, like, a grade five or six piece, I could take the bus and just look, read the score and then come home and play it. But a lot of that would be visualizing the instrument and using the rhythmic stuff and there'd be some you know depending on the the stylistic period of the piece and this is another big part of tonal audiation is that different periods have different harmonic traditions like in terms of chord progressions so you could be very good at audiating you know box harmonic uh i like the term yeah. harmonic palette right everyone these composers have their uh, this is how joe pass described it he said you know when you're playing with another musician, you start to become aware of what kinds of chords they like, what kinds of chord progressions they like, and you adjust to that when you play with them. But, you know, there's no doubt that different yep. different periods of music have different harmonic traditions. And so, yeah, just because you're good at playing Bach does not mean you're good at playing, you know, Metheny tunes, or just because you're good at Metheny tunes does not mean you're necessarily good at playing, uh, you know, swing tunes. There's different harmony in these tunes. And so, you might have a really well-developed set of tonal patterns and uh, harmonic audiation in one genre, but not another. That happens all the time. I mean, I've, I've played with some monster blue player, blues players who, if you start putting even just basic substitutions in, they just, they can't, they can't audiate those types of substitutions, but the, the stuff that they can audiate that's within their command yeah. is like oh, absurdly sure. well audiated. Yeah, I could. I can't help but come back to my own experience of, you know, I definitely was not taught to audiate, <laughs> uh, you know, but <laughs> what I would do is I would play the music and once you've done it, you know, a couple, three times, then it, then it did get into my ear. So I'm decoding initially. And then, and then I would imagine, okay, how would Maurice Andre sound? <laughs> right and it's like how uh, beautiful would that tone yeah. be and can i represent this piece the way maurice andre would represent uh you know it was like what i aspired to so i am layering over my musicianship once i've decoded and I, you know i've cheated say because i'm I've totally decoded i'm not audiating but once i've played it enough um i my mm. powers of audiation came in you know were brought to bear at some point and this is before we knew anything about you know audiation at all you know just through high school mm -hmm. and college even mm -hmm. um but i had i didn't i couldn't audiate harmonically and if i if you can that's going to bring so much more uh uh direction and line uh phrasing uh, so much to uh you're going to bring a lot more uh attention to the stuff you can't put on the page, you can't, right? You just can't art, write the articulations that are appropriate, you know, for each line. It's cool too, because if you can, if you can harmonize, if, if, <laughs> harmonize, that's my, that's my word for oh, harmonic audiation. I like it. <laughs> if you can harmonically, if you can harmonically audiate, you essentially could improvise some kind of counterpoint on what you're doing. Like, you know, if we're in the key of A minor, and I see G sharp, I immediately am thinking of E7. Like, there's no way to stop that. Like, if I see a G sharp fall on the macro beat, especially, or if I see an F fall on the macro beat, I'm thinking, like, is that F? Is that D minor? Is that E7 flat nine? Is that G7? Like, there's all these notes that could fit with that one. There's all these chords that could fit with that one note or these functions. Or is that yeah, like a C yeah. sus or like whatever? But uh, that's actually a fun thing oh, yeah. to do if you. See, you I you take it. You take it. This a... is one thing I think I do. Even so, even last night, you know, I'm playing um, some traditional jazz from the 20s, 30s, 
I'm sitting in with the band that I know really well. I've played with them more than anybody. And it's like, I'm playing something. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I'm going to play around Dorian kind of like, it, it's like right there for a couple seconds. Like, Hey, this could be, I, that they, over, like, I've got two tonalities going on simultaneously. The one that's really there and the one I'm playing with <laughs> over top of something. Well, I mean, that, that's the, that's the, the modal interchange. Yeah. Stuff. It's great, right? I mean, most jazz tunes, most jazz tunes, if you're on a minor one chord, they play a minor six chord, which is yeah. implying Dorian, but you're not. But, but I'm like really trying to establish, you're not in Dorian. you know, like something that's a little, <laughs> you know, you might say it's a little out, but, um, but no, it just, it's just like, yeah. I can, you know, G, A, those two notes can mean, you know, a hundred things. Oh, for sure. You know, de depending on where it lands and, yeah, and yeah. whether it's over top of this change or that change. So it's kind of like there's just these layers again. So, so I, you know, if they, if you have a kid who's not high tonal aptitude, it's not just about playing the the notes that they're reading. Uh, you want to keep right. You you want to have in their audiation stuff beyond what what they're reading, beyond what's on the page. So, um, and at. at that that's why you can have so much fun playing simple melodies because if you if you played just a single line melody no harmony but you can audiate the harmony underneath it and even audiate substitutions the playing the simple thing actually becomes much more entertaining because your 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 experience of it is a lot more rich it goes a lot deeper than just what's being essentially played it's notation the then uh, just a, a in the end a, a shortcut so I, I wanted to come back to what you were describing, though. You can take a piece of notation that you can't totally audiate, and then you can decode it and learn how to audiate it. I think that's where a lot of people um, yep. get to, because it, it's it essentially, it's the only thing that becomes realistic to do unless you're going to... I mean, I highly recommend, if you if you learn a 21st century piece of music that's really not atonal, but it's just chaotic, right? It's just all over the place. Get a recording of it, but also like when you start decoding it, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the decoding if you're aware that that's what you're doing. And I think that's a, that's the crucial distinction here is that if you think that decoding is audiating and that you know it's just the regular definite sight reading, that's where you get into trouble because you you fooled yourself. You you think you're audiating something, and you're not audiating it. But if you formally actually pick up a piece of music and say, right now I'm decoding. I'm playing these notes on my instrument. I, just, I can't even just, hear them yeah. in my head before I play them. <laughs> then, <laughs> then that, that's fine because then what you end up doing is taking yourself through uh, whether it's rope song procedure or the, the learning sequence. I mean, what I'll do is I'll, I'll listen to the song, sing along with it while I go for walks and stuff. But then when I'm actually sitting with my instrument, if there is some kind of weird tonal pattern that I've never encountered before, I will kind of drill that in and improvise with it. And it just takes some time to yeah, I'll get into Rand your ears. <laughs> I just... Yeah, I mean, I, I think more people should be singing. Um, I mean, basically, you take a resting tone, you sing every major and minor triad against it. I think if we did that, I mean, that's only 24. or it's, I mean, I guess depending on how you look at it. But it's not a lot. And I think if you did that, twice a day for a couple of years, I think what, what happened to your ears is, is not. Um, because if you look at the tonalities that we play in, there's only a few essential functions for each one. But even even say you want to add all the functions for every tonality, plus um, there's some extra ones for major and minor that aren't necessarily just in the vanilla tonality. There's still some cool functions that aren't in there. You know, like A minor to F minor. Like, where does that come from? It's in a lot of stuff, though. It's everywhere. It's in, like, the Darth Vader theme and the, the Gollum's theme from Lord of the Rings has that change in it. And it, that change is actually in a lot of music, but it's not spelled out by any single tonality. So that's the stuff you run into in, you yeah. know, in the in the wild. But the, the decoding part. So, like, I wanted to talk about decoding. So what happens... Uh, to me, and I, I don't know if this is different 
than you, Eric, but like I teach instrumental and a lot of, I'll get students who are playing saxophone in high school band. So they're in grade eight or grade nine. They're playing saxophone. So they're having to do decoding. Um, you know, the question is, what do you do? Because you're essentially not getting rid of the decoding that's taking place in their right. life. Right. Um, they're, they're taking this band class and you can't, I mean, you could convince them not to take it, but I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I think I still think it's good. So the question is: Does decoding actively damage someone's tonal audiation, or does the de well, is is doing this de uh, decoding just taking up time that, that could be spent on tonal that patterns? Just um, technical imitation decoding, and is an imitation just that half a step away from audiation. So once you've decoded it, you know that you can get it. That's the that's the side door from notational ideation uh, decode it and then well and you can you can ameliorate this issue so if someone's imitating through decoding you can just get rid of that uh so not not get rid of the activity so they could be decoding like they bring a piece that they're working on in concert band to me they have some kind of melody and i just say can you sing that yeah <laughs> can you sing the resting tone to what you just played and it, it doesn't necessarily cause an issue i will tend to if 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 it's like severe imitation where where they're like really, you know, not carrying this tune, I will apply more pressure on the like, can you sing it? Can you whistle it? Can you because even the problem, the problem with asking someone to play someone by asking someone to play something by memory still doesn't get rid of the issue, because even if they play it from memory, they can still be they can, have they can it, still audit the rhythm without right, they can have the tone memorized. Right. Versus what Gordon would call. Uh, better uh, call recall through audiation because they're different well which is that is what Rand blake recommends that you do before you even attempt to play something on the instrument so when he says you learn a melody you know you first listen to the recording and you sing along with it and then eventually you sing without the recording and, and you and then you even just try to mentally recall the the piece in your head you go through all these steps before you learn to play the thing on your instrument and this is what I do now when I learn pieces. So like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, if I'm learning a piece that's like two or three pages, I'm not just going to keep playing the whole piece from start to finish. It's just a giant waste of time. I'll, I'll take little eight bar fragments and I'll try to, I'll learn them instrumentally so I can play them on the, on the, on, you know, on the fingerboard and just decoding wise. And I'll learn to sing them and I'll learn to, I'll try to yep. recall the notes just silently and I'll try to sing the resting tone or, or what I'll do is I'll, I'll sing the resting tone while yeah. I play it on my guitar. You know, I'll just, I'll just hold that. And so there's you, you know different I, techniques you can do. You know what I'd try love to get to someone do? out of that. Or, the, the first thought I had was this, is that how many band directors or, you know, whatever, orchestra, stop. All right, everybody, letter A, sing. <laughs> or just get the resting tone that's at, letter a and then say it modulates and say okay everybody stop just sing the resting tone of letter c or what you could do is you could you could do something exactly like that but you could say like okay half the saxes sing half the saxes play half yeah, the, yeah, half the that, flutes sing half the flutes awesome. play and you run through that, it and that's you a switch great idea i i i just don't think there i don't know if i've ever ran into uh a band or orchestra director that made them saying, I would like to stand up in front of, you know, any symphony orchestra mm -hmm. and do some of this and see how many decoders there really are. And, you know, in our most prestigious, you know, quote unquote, uh, musical institutions. <laughs> but I mean, there's no doubt that if you have a really strong, like rhythmic aptitude and you can rhythmically um, notationally audiate, you can get away with murder. <laughs> you really can. Like if you have good technique and you have good uh, rhythmic audiation, like you can really go to town on this stuff and, and you can wind up graduating, you know, like a master's degree and still it. not like be able to audiate <laughs> one, I, four, I, five. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what I'm saying. So, I mean, and I can you know, I, I'll, I'll admit I get somewhat frustrated because like I, uh, I, I've done a lot of private music instruction, like with my own development. I don't have a university degree, but I can audit a lot of changes and I meet people that have bachelor's degrees and master's degrees. And I'm like, 
Oh my goodness! Like it's it's uh, it's 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 wild. Um, even composers like which is oh, uh, oh listen <laughs> I don't know how I, I, I don't know how like a roommate of the great George Crumb had a son who I was a roommate with. <laughs> he couldn't follow a sitcom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the plot of a sitcom. I don't know what he was doing when he was composing. I always, I always would ask him, you know. So how are you thinking of this? What do you, you know? Can you sing? Can you sing the? And he says, I don't have to sing it. I hear it. And I didn't know if he could audiate or not. Um, but it's like all, all he did was spend his time, you know, with a score in front of him and a pencil, and mm -hmm. never any music. There was never any music going on. It was all kind of like fabric fabricated. You never know, too. It's like it's possible that there's a disconnect between, you know, what he could audiate and what he could perform based on, you know, just some disconnect in the brain between the ear and the voice, or you know, something, uh, something physically wrong. So, so Chikoria, there's a video of Chikoria talking about that. He's saying like people ask him, can he sing what's he, what he's going to improvise before he plays it? And he's like, no, I can't sing it. But what he really means is his voice sucks and he can't execute the pitches. He can definitely audiate what he's playing before he plays it. And so you get into these weird things because like we've talked about this. When I improvise, I make it a goal. Like if I can't sing the note before I play it, like it's not like I can't experiment with it. But that's not really what I want to be playing because that's not really improv. That's kind of this like. It's more of like a theoretical slash creative exploration. I mean, I'm not really, yeah. I'm not really summoning like you know something from my mind when I'm improving like that. Um, and so it's fine. That's part of it. But I think I think it, back to what I was saying about decoding. It, it's fine to do all this stuff, but it's different when you when you have the intention or when you just know what you are doing. Like right now, I'm decoding something and I'm trying to get it in my ear. I think that's when decoding comes less of a problem especially with guitar so i see some issues here like guitar for example you can play the same e note on every sing on every string and so there's some issues when you start if you start using i think pure um like the pure way that we learn how to uh, uh notationally audiate tonally with with the learning sequence uh, that gordon presents you have to learn how to decode if you're going to learn how to read music on the guitar. Like, and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about just learning how to read a couple of melodies. I'm talking about learning how to play like, you know, the, the most advanced like concert guitar repertoire. And so I think it's, I think it starts getting crazy when people say like decoding is like pure evil and that, you know, sight reading doesn't actually exist. Like, you know, the claims Gordon was saying, because I think a lot of those claims are, they're kind of made to bring out the point that people aren't actually audiating things. I don't, I don't think at the end of the day, you still, you can't avoid some decoding training because, you know, an instrument like the guitar, um, you have to know where the individual pitches are laid out. You have to know how the instrument is laid out. And there's no yeah. doubt that there's some yeah. study that goes into that. But, but the question is, we don't just throw out learning how to audiate this stuff. And I mean, jazz is great. Like there's a, there's a lot of modern jazz players that have, it seems like in the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years, Eric, what do you think? But learning how to sight read has become more part oh, of the yeah. jazz ethos than it used to yeah. be. Yeah, well, there's just so many more uh, scores from great jazz greats that, that eventually turn to, you know, writing. So, I mean, I, I think it just depends um, what someone's goals are and how you want to use your time. I don't think there's anything wrong with decoding going on in band class and it, depending on your um depending on what you're doing as a music teacher right i mean if you have young kids and they're not playing instruments i mean why even start there's no point to do any decoding it just doesn't yeah. make any sense well i i, I think um, um i want to go back and con contextualize you know G gordon railed against certain things but i think most of that was um just the poor practices that are in public music education you know, or private music education, sure. as opposed to, you know, what is the best for this, <laughs> this guy to become a monster? Um, but of course, you're going to need the aptitude, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and the want to, which we brought up before the, you know, intrinsic motivation and the high enough aptitude. And then the, you know, and then the, you know, just learn through the oral tradition. Oh, my God, then, 
right? Then you, you've got homework for the rest of your life if you're that kind of person. Um, well, well, take for example, like I want to I want to touch on what you just said. Like the uh, if, if you take someone's aptitude and just their history, even if they just have medium aptitude, but they've spent their life singing songs and they have huge tonal repertoire and stuff. If they show up as a as an eleven year old and they're going to start a classical guitar method book that's basically decoding centered, if they have all that other stuff in their ear already, things generally turn out fine. You know, it's it's not like all over the place. But man, if you try to use one of those methods with someone who, you know, you can't get them to sing a resting tone, it's it's really like pulling teeth. And I wish I had the name of the study, but there was a study done on, um, I believe it was clarinet players that were in the grade five, six or seven range. I don't know the exact range, but they compared two groups, one group that learned how to read music right away and the other one that delayed it for quite a while. And I think it was a long interval, like 32 weeks or something like that. The likelihood of the, the dropout rate was very high with the students yeah, that well, learned to sure. decode right away the, for the next year. And so, I, I mean, this is really valuable to know, especially if you're a private music teacher, but in the school system too. Um, if you look at my retention rates, they're super high. I, I have like one or two kids per year that leaves. And sometimes it's because they literally move schools, right? And I don't push the notation basically until they well, start they're there asking for the me. Music. To they're not music. there to figure out the puzzle of this note, put this finger down and count and all the stuff that we typically do. That just destroys a kid who who wants to be musical. You know, you kind of, ha- I've always said you, you, you need yep. these two things to, you know, survive the the normal gauntlet that you go through with traditional music learning, and that is, you know, you've got mm-hmm. you've got to have the decoding brain down and like that, and be able to figure things out quickly. You know, deep pu- the puzzle of what notation looks like and how that turns, you know, and and then you just got to be motivated, um, and you know, and that music aptitude, maybe three 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 things then, but that. I mean, that was my experience, Eric, when I started playing the saxophone. I um, So I got the band method book, you know, grade seven, band essential <laughs> elements. I think that was the book. But then my mom was like, do you want any other music books? And I'm so glad she asked this because I got this Disney solos for alto sax. And this was genius because the band book had the fingering chart. The Disney book had, you know, 15 songs that I could sing by memory. And so when I started decoding these pieces, I wasn't really... Um, rhythmically even caring about like what i was reading i just knew what the song sounded like and it said you play a d by pushing these fingers down and you know that was totally fine like within the day i was playing a bunch of songs it wasn't an issue but again the reason that worked is because i had watched some of these disney movies you know how kids watch the same movie like 40 times a day i just had these songs burned into my mind but uh i mean for i think that's such a big part of it is that if you are going to do decoding, it makes such a difference if the kids know the song by memory, because at least when they play it, they can tell, well, that sounds yeah, like the yeah. thing I can audiate, you know? And and so I think if you are a band teacher, I mean, one way you could get around this is if you want to do some decoding, maybe make them learn songs that they know. Like, and that's why choosing songs from movies are good or just like these folk melodies. But a lot of kids don't know the, the folk repertoire right now. But I mean, that can make a huge difference because if, yeah, again, decoding with the emphasis of bringing out something you can audiate, it turns into a, a more of a musical activity. But if it's decoding and we don't even know what the song's supposed to sound like, I mean, how are you supposed to know what you're, yeah, what you're doing? Yeah. Again, I want to distinguish uh, playing by memory and, and, and playing by recall. Um, that was something that Gordon really made a, a point of and during my cl- cl- class with, with him, I told, uh, there's yeah, memorization. Yeah. Uh, and then there's, you know, uh, by recall, you, you're, as you're playing a phrase, you're audiating the next phrase uh, as it comes along. It's not like completely, it, it's, in, it's embedded in your audiation as opposed to embedded in some kind of other version of recall. So this is interesting because what I see here, there's two main types of memorization that people do. Uh, one is uh, you literally memorize what the sheet music looks like and you play from the sheet music in your memory, which to me is like the most crazy version of this. But I mean, some serious memorizers do this. 
Um, the other one, though, is if you play an instrument, you, you're doing kinesthetic memorization. So you remember, like on the guitar, this could be visual too, and same with the piano, because you know you can you can get the music off the page. You can decode the music off the page, put it on the piano visually, and then remember what the piano visually looks like, what you play. And I think a lot of people are actually doing that on the guitar and the piano. But the other one, what, what you're talking about is you're you're recalling the friggin' sounds, <laughs> <laughs> which is like, I mean, that's there's there's part of it. This is like one of my favorite parts of MLT is that you know it goes very deep in a lot of aspects, but the the front gate of MLT is like. Like the whole point of this is like this is a musical uh, activity. So I mean, what Eric, what you're saying is like memorization. You need to memorize this the actual sounds. Yeah. The audiation memorization, not the kinesthetic memorization. Yeah. Or Although the, or doesn't all that eventually thing. line up somehow? Like. Well, that's what I was saying is that like eventually, you know, eventually you know what a 16 bar phrase sounds like. And so when you visually see this like tidal wave of you, there's like four lines of music and they all happen to have four bars, you kind of are able yeah. to audiate. There's a punchline coming. All right. So it does. It does link up. And I think that's I think that's where you get guys like Stravinsky, who I think he had that alignment between his audiation and his his theoretical creativity down. And I mean, Stravinsky is a great example of this for me because everything seemed like it was in the service of either some really cool rhythmic idea or just a melody yeah. that was, you know, just it, it, I, I, his example for me is, is one of the most vivid because his, his stuff doesn't sound like it was mechanistically created. It sounds like it just came out of like, you know, someone's soul. But even though I know he was doing a lot of like theoretical, uh, exploration with his instrument, but, you know, it still had to pass this level of was it something that he could audiate? And I think he was I think he was good at doing I've, I've said this before on the podcast, but I think he was good at, at doing what you were describing, where he can you could decode something or take something theoretically, but then push himself through the sequence and learn to audiate it rather quickly and start to improvise with it and start to. Yeah. And so, I mean, even someone like that's why I like Paul Harris, because I think, you know, Paul Harris's methods, um, I think, are a nice bridge from learning how like i think if you want to teach students some theory and how to decode early in their musical exploration the way that paul does it makes a lot of sense because you know he's he's always going to introduce something as a sound first that you have to improvise with with your mouth and your instrument and, and drum and then you know really at the start it's just like hey that thing we just did looks like this and then over time you know that gets more in depth but i think i think the way that he does it it is uh while it's not totally the the way that the the capital mlt community lays it out it it's aware of the principles yeah i large i, I want to open a, a, a um, can of worms that we can <laughs> that we can eat in a f episode down the line but aren't we ultimately creating the brain to be some kind of synesthetic synesthetic monster because eventually your eyes and the music totally. become one. That's notational audiation. Your breath and how you know much pressure I put into my trumpet becomes you know part of notational, or or becomes part of my my you know performance ability audiation. It's like so these things start to line up, like the rhythm, the you know the the harmonic. It's like and and now there's the notation, you know. So the, now there's a visual cue for what I already know how to audiate. Um, hopefully right that's how it's supposed to go so it's like a great example of this is memorization so when you memorize a piece i think you should be practicing all i think you should be practicing the kinesthetic memorization you should be practicing just the whether it's silent audiated recall of of the song or singing fine um and uh memorizing what the notation looks like I mean, I think if you practice recalling all three of those, I used to do this all the time in high school. I would just, I would just hold my right arm out like it was a guitar fretboard, and I would practice. I would just mentally rehearse what I was going over because, you know, you might, you might be losing a little bit because you don't have the real guitar in your hand. But the recall is powerful. There's no doubt that recall is one of the best. Uh, I think in the last couple podcasts, I I brought up this idea about spacing, like the literature on spacing research. But if there's any teachers out there, um, you should read the book, Make It Stick. 
it goes over a lot of these learning principles like the uh, spacing principle and it, you know why you want to interleave stuff and why you want to practice recall. Re I mean, recall is one of the best things you can do uh, for learning. Um, people generally overestimate, you know, if you listen to a song and you're, you know, you're in the stage of audition where you can audit the song while you're listening to it, but you just haven't memorized the song. I mean, you really can get fooled thinking you know the song, but then you try to recall yeah, it on your yeah. own. And I like to not I there. like to ram things into my children's audition really hard for a couple of weeks, and then give them a couple of weeks off of that and go on to something else and then come back to it. It's amazing. For sure. I mean, even with the uh, with the tonal patterns uh, that we often talk about. I mean, I don't do tonal patterns at the start of class and all that, but. I actually think based on the spacing research, it'd be better to do to the tonal patterns at the beginning and the end of class, because even if you only have a half an hour class, there's about a half an hour gap between the, the exposures. And that would be very good for, for people to, to have that. I mean, you would, let's say you're going to sing a set of tonal patterns a few times. You're better off splitting that up at the start of class and the end of class based on the spacing research than at the beginning of class, unless the task is so... Know, difficult that people yeah it needs to be in some kind that, of range but... um that's between easy and and too difficult <clears throat> like another paul harris reference. yeah um yeah so i mean this uh, some interesting things come up around uh so did we did we decoding address sure. reading notation actually stifle tonal tonal audiation we we covered that pretty well well, I mean, this is the the one question I had about this is that the way it's usually phrased in the MLT community, that reading notation early damages tonal audiation. But my real, my the, the I don't like the way that that's phrased because I think what that's saying is that if you read notation and learn to decode and learn to do tonal patterns, the decoding somehow is damaging your tonal pattern audiation and all that. I think it's more, I think more what the point is, is that you only have limited amount of class time instruction and any time you spend using these decoding methods that are out of sequence you're forfeiting time spent that could be done on tonal patterns or other oral activity i think that is the i i feel like that's the correct interpretation of that i don't i don't feel like you know just the decoding in and of itself is well, causing this is how you start damage. on an instrument and and i think those it, you referenced it yourself earlier in the conversation those kids quit because they're there for the music and we're teaching them decoding and then they're not also getting the tonal patterns rhythm patterns and harmonic uh understanding that's why teaching by memory and by rote works so well instrumentally i mean it's ha really hard to do this with a band class because uh you can't you can't take care of the individual needs if one student's really memorizing something quickly and you know a couple of the people around them aren't it's hard to keep them up to speed with it. But if you're a one-on-one -on -one teacher, I mean, basically what I do when I teach instrumentally by rote, you know, I sing the song a couple of times. I'll get them to sing it if they're down for that. If they're not comfortable yet singing, whatever. I just teach them the song, like, and, one note at a time. Yeah, but all our <laughs> right? music and instruction is so by rote. Um, page bound when we get into, you know, band orchestras, et cetera. Uh, and... So, I mean, actually, I wanted to bring up another thing. So I have some students that are doing like the Royal Conservatory exams now. And I mean, you have to use, uh, there are sight reading requirements for the grades and all that. I pretty much avoid all of it as much as possible. I teach them like the minimum amount of sight reading they have to do to take the exam. But when I, when they start getting into the first couple grades, I show them the notation, but I just teach them how to play everything by rote and I make them listen to all the songs. And we don't actually spend time doing decoding. I mean, I might I, I might take like an eight bar phrase and on their music, write down like that first note of that phrase is a D. But then after that, I'm showing them how to play it by rote on the piano. It's They're listening to the recordings that come with the books. And so like the the notation is kind of there, but it's really not like, it's not like I'm, I'm opening the notation and saying, okay, start reading one, two, three, four, you start from beat one, especially for a solo instrument. There just doesn't seem to be a need to do that i mean some of the kids man i have this one kid who's taking a test in in the next week or two but his versions of the songs that he's playing he's taking the first royal conservatory level they sound as good as the freaking recordings that come with the cd 
that like that come with the book and just from learning how to play these things by yeah, memory, isn't this seeing them. part of a practical compromise at some level versus you know getting on the bandstand and playing with the jazz crates or or taking home a recording of your part in the band and seeing how that fits in and learn your part from a recording yeah i think that, i think there's definitely like a practical um there's a practical compromise some of the best band teachers that i know in the area where i live their band teachers uh the band teachers are standing the kids home with recordings of oh, the concert nice. pieces and i i actually think yeah, that that's really rare like how often are the kids aware of their own melody and they don't know what's going totally. on in the rest of the band totally. because they've never yeah, actually every listened band to concert it. i've been to in our area it's abominable my daughter i'd pick her up after her concert and she'd you know and my ex would pick would would show up later from work or I would have to show up so we'd be different. She'd always come home with me it's like dad. <laughs> you know, this band this band does not know how to play music. And she'd always totally. just kind of want to barf as she got off the stage because how badly oh, out of tune and yeah. unfulfilling it was musically. But she was good and she's a good musician and she um, you know, hung in there for a good amount of time. There you know there's another uh there's another thing that i that i wanted to bring up before we wrap this up you know some band teachers are sending their kids home to study with like a, like a program like smart music and one of the reasons i really like this is that you know if you're going to use decoding i mean you're using decoding okay so they're doing some kind of imitation but if they have no way of pressing play on a recording and hearing what that recording actually sounds like the decoding really gets out of hand because you can't imitate without a you know yeah. an imitation goal you have to be emulating a sound but like you know, program like this smart music, the kids can actually, they go home with like a concert band piece and they can see the sheet music for the whole freaking concert band yeah. and they can press play and hear what the exact part sounds like. And I, I, I think that that, that in terms of that's compromise, what, yeah, that's what we're starting trying to, to get do is, is deal with the reality really of what, you know, 99% of all music teachers do out there and then overlap audiation and MLT ideas. And they it just doesn't quite make it relative to the, you know, small case MLT. Uh, what what could be happening? Like you know, just New Orleans, just get get together and play, you know. <laughs> oh, totally. Uh, the the other the the other thing I was gonna mention is that like, if you know, I'm a classical guitarist, so my my experience here is more fleshed out. But like some of the beginning classical guitar. Um, method books have pieces that are very difficult to audiate but very easy to play by memorization by physical memorization and this is where you know it gets hard to actually make a, a reasonable curriculum because what you want is you want something that for a beginner that makes sense to audiate at that level tonally and rhythmically but also makes sense to physically kinesthetically memorize and some of the pieces are you know way off the chart on one of those they'll be it'll be uh like i said it'll be really easy to memorize hard to audio and sometimes it'll be the opposite right and so you know some method books don't take that stuff into account because it's so decoding centered that yeah yeah so pianists yeah. don't need to have high tonal aptitude <laughs> and it's good for all students to drop notation and go learn something off of a you know off an appropriate you know recording and then and if you do have to make compromises i mean this is such a this is such a good point too eric is that like it doesn't mean all of their musical activity has to be spent doing decoding so if like say for example if they're learning a song they could learn to play that song through decoding and another song by ear by rote all that other stuff there's a there's a balance or even in an individual song you could teach you could get them to kind of decode part of it and then teach the other part by rote or by by ear um yeah i think there's a lot of if you're kind of forced yeah. into using decoding earlier than you want to it, it doesn't mean that that should be all yeah. of their musical so activity. if you're only reading in the other last question can reading notation at the piano stifle tonal audiation that's uh, you know i i don't think so um it, it, it might not grow at all if you don't teach kids you know resting tones and, and give them some harmonic uh you know framework over top which they're playing their phrases yeah um that that'll you can't but not 
a little bit uh, of help, but I don't think it, it'll stifle it. You're, you're, it. The worst thing that's happening is they're, yeah. they're exploring with their fingers the notes on the piano, and they eventually gets in their ear. So they're they are acculturating, self acculturating, I suppose. I mean, one of the things that I like to do when I'm first getting students into the decoding side of things, you know, because if we do tonal patterns and I show them notationally what they look like, I'll I'll just put a song um, in notation, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and I will just change the rhythm of it so that they can see, like, they know some rhythm patterns and they can notationally audiate the rhythm patterns, but then they start to see yeah. how these rhythm patterns look like in the context yeah, of a, the tones, a really changing. simple level so, of inference learning, right there. Yeah, it's super simple, right? Or, or I'll, I'll put two of them on the on the on the page, and it'll be twinkle and triple, and twinkle and duple, and I'll just play one of them, and and I'll just say which one did I play? Did I play the one on the left or the right? And I think those are those are good things to do when people are first start getting into notation, you know, because uh, yeah, it's just very simple yeah. generalization. I got a couple students though, like I, I just start putting all the rhythms you can think of in, in Twinkle, all the rhythm patterns. It's a hilarious little, uh, I mean, I, I really like the Suzuki yeah. method does that. You know, you learn to play Twinkle know, with but, yeah, 40 yeah. different rhythms. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but not the different tonalities. So how early also fun to do. in life should uh, we be teaching children inference level activities so this is a story i posted yesterday my keyboard ran out of batteries okay. and the charged ones i had left at home so i went around and tried to find something because i am i am dependent upon my keyboard sometimes more than i should be or whatever um so i'm sitting with this class and i pull out my recorder and i play three familiar songs in major and I say, now listen to these songs. They have a different resting tone. So resting tone is where we end. And I think I've used the, the term before, you know, because I've had the kids, you know, sing the end of a bunch of songs that I, I've done. But I haven't really taught them tonal patterns and rhythm patterns uh, traditionally, uh, through traditional MLT. But I have been doing my harmonic learning sequence with them, right? So I just played these three songs in major, familiar, and then these three songs in minor, and I goofed up the words, you know, kind of put them together, you know, how I wonder my fair lady, you know, kind of thing, like, okay. Um, and then I asked seven kids individually, and who, who else wants, and I played a melody, an unfamiliar melody, I, I created a melody on the spot, you know, just short, two, two or four bars, I don't remember, and the kids would say, oh, that's, that belongs to resting tone do, and that belongs to resting tone la. And I had never used resting tone do la, but maybe once before, the week before, and every kid got it right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have time to do the other half of the class. And oh, this is four-year-olds. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, that's great. you know, context is everything, right? So the context of, you know, you're having to deal with notation, on the page to get a band to play together. You're having to use notation because the music's too hard for you to figure it out by ear on your own. Uh, and so you're sneaking in the site. So there's like a lot of... Op this actually happened to me the other... This happened to me last week. A student of mine, we're learning this drum part, intro from this song that I can't for the life of me remember the 16 bars. And it's just... <laughs> it, it is just... Uh, um, Micro beats and macro beats. It's just eighth notes and quarter notes. And it's just such an odd phrasing that I like cannot memorize it. Like, I don't know. I, I might be not audiating the right meter because there's no way you could be deciphering the meter based on, you know, the pattern. But we, we got to the point where we could play it. And I, this was a case where with this student and uh, I never use notation with her ever. I just wrote it down. And we used that for a couple of weeks together yeah. and now we both have it. But, you know, that was a case where, you know, she hated playing classical piano and decoding. But w when I'm teaching her drums and we just couldn't remember the kick and the snare pattern, I just wrote it down using micro beats and macro beats. And it, it was it was just enough to kind of help. Yeah, that no, I, I, I think there's a. But it's funny to know, like when, you know, when is it yeah, helpful? And I... When is it not helpful? 
I think you know, like that 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 you really are are doing a, a disservice not to use notation sometimes because it's not the music that's difficult. It's the you know it's a an odd pattern. It it doesn't it doesn't it's not a, 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 it's something it's hard to recall. It's just oh. hard to recall. It, it, you, it's hard yes. to recall in its entirety. I could recall like in I could recall two bars of it, but I couldn't recall like the full like sixteen bars. You know, we didn't even get into all this, but like I do think that um trying to decode rhythmic notation can mess with rhythmic audiation because no, we, <laughs> we didn't even get another into episode. That. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I really think I really think it can though. Well um that's a, so that was that was fun. That's an hour <laughs> answer to your question there. Thank you very much. We love it. That's um, fun. The more, the better. Fun. Yeah. So we love doing, uh, it, it's been a lot of fun for us to answer some of these uh, listener questions. So if you guys have any questions or any specific things on your mind, um, yeah, maybe in the future we might do an episode that's a mashup of a, of have, a bunch of questions. Have somebody that has a question well, we could do live with them if they're able. Yeah, and this topic we wanted to go deep in because we haven't really talked about decoding on this podcast at all. So yep, it was kind one. of a nice uh, segue into to that. I guess tonal decoding, the, the <laughs> topic. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thanks. All right, Eric. Take care.